Markets have been volatile since February 2nd, when U.S. payroll figures released that day showed stronger than expected wage growth figures and prompted concerns about inflation and future interest rates. Now, higher interest rates prompt concerns about future economic growth and can result in lower equity valuations. Markets moved into correction territory on February 8th when the Dow Jones fell more than 1,000 points, sending the index more than 10% below the record highs it reached in late January and making the downswing an official Dow correction. But here to put that extreme volatility into perspective is Fran Canary, Head of Portfolio Construction for Vanguard's Investment Strategy Group. Hi, Fran. Hi, Emily. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So I think we should probably start off with some context. What is this volatility? What caused it? I think always uh, cause can be a little difficult. Uh, sometimes there is one cause. You think Brexit or mm-hmm. you know the tragic events of 9-11. Um, but more often than not, it's a series of events coming together. And so you've outlined some of them in your introduction on February 2nd, mm-hmm. uh, the payroll data. So there is concerns. Interest rates have been rising um, for the last you know, four to five months. And so those are two of the common causes we hear. Yeah, so there's obviously a confluence of factors, but you know, 1,000 points, 10%, those are big numbers and can seem kind of extreme. Can you put those into perspective for us? Yeah, I think the 1,000 the points in the Dow is, is what grabs, you know, it's, it's the right. questions I get asked most when Sorry. I'm traveling about is 1,000 points. I think we have to put that into perspective. It's always good to use percentages, right? So when the Dow was at 10,000, a 4% move would be 400 points. But now that we're at 25,000, or we were, a, you know, a 4% move is 1,000 points. So it's really a testament to the growth of how far we've come. And so we have to get used to these big numbers and maybe insulate our emotions from these big numbers. Because the good news is, as the market rises, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we should expect more and more of these big numbers. Yeah, so then even just to bring it back even further, and what does it mean for investors today? What, you know... Could you put that into perspective? Yeah, so certainly 4% down or a, a correction uh, down is certainly things that you know are not good and don't sure. make us feel good, and we lose uh, equity capital and our value of capital. But again, putting it in perspective, um, there have been over 140 moves down of more than 4% in history. So this is not abnormal. In the last 20 years, uh, we've had uh, 10 uh, corrections, which you've you've identified as a 10% correction. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Davis, our chief economist, um, actually had been out and about telling folks, uh, and we have a lot of stuff on Vanguard.com, uh, that a 70% chance was our estimate of a correction. So this does not surprise us. It doesn't feel good, obviously, Sorry. when we look at our statements, but uh, what is occurring doesn't surprise us. Yes, I, I think we've also all termed it to pan out. So when you're looking at you know day to day or even just a year's movement, it could be really a sucker punch. But you know when you go back a couple of years or even longer decades, um, it seems to be like a more of kind of a natural turn of events. Right. Yeah. I mean, think even even with this 10 percent correction, the one year return we're still up 20 percent. So the, the, the not the year to date. But the 52 weeks. So if you look at your one-year return from you know the beginning of February this year to last year, and the five-year return, we're up 15% compounded annually on most of the major benchmarks. So we've had a a really long bull market. It's been very low volatile market. So we've we've been marching up almost at a snail's pace. You know, a quarter of a percent here, a quarter percent there. And so what is new is this volatility or return of volatility. Mm -hmm. And while it is new, it's not unique. Well, so it's not unique. Um, Also not unique is that impetus to act. So I think as an investor opening their statement or seeing these headlines, there is that tendency to want to do something. So what should investors do? Yeah, so Vanguard uh, also put a plug in for Vanguard.com and, and, and the information we're putting out there. We've put a lot of the volatility and perspective mm-hmm. articles out there. My team also developed what is known as risk speedometers, okay. and it looks at cash flow. It looks at how are investors behaving. And so the, it, we don't have early February results yet, but through most of the last year, people were acting you know, very responsibly. We saw balanced cash flows mm-hmm. um, in, in mix of stocks, bonds, and money markets. 
markets at other you know, runaway markets. So if you look at 1999 or 2007, other long bull markets, we saw everyone into the equity market. Mm -hmm. So here, even though we've had one of the longest and strongest bull markets, investors have really been behaving very well, whether they're doing it on their own or working with an advisor, we're seeing really good behavior. We'll see at the end of February if that held, but certainly uh, the messages of education of staying the course and rebalancing have worked. So let's talk a little bit about equity and bond markets and you know the decline across both. The why and you know what does that mean? Yeah, so they can be linked. Um, so if interest rates have uh, risen really since Labor Day, if mm -hmm. you will, since September, we hit a four-year high. Um, on the 10-year treasury um, in this event. And so equities often are a discounted free cash flow, so mm -hmm. you, you're discounting it at a higher rate. Bonds can also be competitive to equities. So okay. if you start to you know, think about equities in a 1.5% bond market versus maybe a 3% bond market, they can be seen as competitive for your next dollar. Mm -hmm. So those two reasons um, you know, can cause a readjustment in how valuations look. But we'll have to see. It's still, we're only into this for about a week. Yes, that is good perspective. It has just been a week. And often, you know, we're looking at a much longer term perspective, not only just for what we should be doing, but, you know, our plans. So something we've often talked about, I've heard you say this, bonds are a ballast against equity. So if both are declining together, does that change what you should be doing with bonds in your portfolio? Well, a couple of the big days down last week, bonds did exactly what we hoped they would do. So on uh, Monday, the first uh, day that we had the 4% decline, the 1,000-point decline, mm -hmm. bonds across the board, especially high-quality bonds, um, actually had positive returns and pretty significant uh, positive returns. So I think we've had this gradual increase in interest rates um, that we've been discussing since Labor Day or beginning of September. Right. But then in, in the equity sell-off days, um, we've seen bonds continue to diversify. And, and again, what we want to make sure is investors have the right asset allocation going in and really not reacting to this because in between these two down days, we had some pretty strong up days. And so you'll see that we have uh, a lot of these rebound days. So you don't want to you know, get whipsawed of going out and then the market being up 2% the following day, then down 3 So making sure your asset allocation is right and rebalancing back to that is a good course of action. So definitely back to that stay the course message. So you touched on interest rates really quickly. So you know, final thoughts on you know, interest rates, what's to come, and should investors be doing anything? Yeah, for a long time, Vanguard has been out saying don't fear rising interest rates and, and maybe the good news of rising interest rates. A simple math problem, and I'll use round numbers, if interest rates are at 2%, you get 2%, 2%, 2% if they don't move, mm -hmm. right? And so you think about that. But if interest rates go from 2 to 3 mm -hmm. and let's just say you have duration, which is a complicated number, but let's just say you have a duration of 5 Okay. You would... For a 1% rise, you would lose the duration. So you would lose 5%, but you still have the coupon or the income from the bond fund. So your net total return in a 1% move in that scenario would be right around 2.5%. Okay. But now you're going to earn 3% every year. So you can see that your break-even is, is almost about a year and a half, two years. And now the longer you hold it, if you actually hold it for more than five years... You're getting 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%. So at some point, you actually benefit nominally from higher interest rates. And so there is a, a silver lining if you do not sell, right? Mm -hmm. And so, again, we're really making sure that if your holding period is meant to be longer than the duration of the fund you have, it's not you know, a bad situation if interest rates rise. Can you tell us about the global markets? How is this impacting markets in other countries? So the self we've seen and the volatility that we've seen increase is really not a U.S. phenomenon. It's mm -hmm. actually happening around the world. Um, you can see, and, and this is not uncommon, we see correlations, which are how the U.S. markets and non-U.S. markets move. Uh, they, they tend to have high correlation, but in stress, uh, they correlate even more so. And so markets outside of the U.S. have been participating in both the increase in volatility and the decline. And so that's not unexpected. That doesn't mean that diversification still doesn't work. You know, for non-U.S. investors owning the U.S. and for U.S. investors owning non-U.S. because correlation measures degree of things moving together, mm -hmm. um, but there's still a material difference in the returns. So just because two things are moving together doesn't mean that the returns will be identical. So international diversification, and if you're a non-U.S. investor owning the U.S., 
and a U.S. investor owning non-U.S. Um, is makes a lot of sense, even in this market. So definitely an important but and a good perspective on what some of you is more of a disruptive force in your investment plan. Exactly. Uh, some, some great perspective. Anything else that you would add to investors to trying to keep these headlines in perspective? Just remember where we've been, right? You know, very long bull market, uh, very, very low volatility. So I know this does seem like a shock, and it is probably a shock, but this actually is not that unusual. Um, you know, either use a single fund solution that rebalances for you um, or work with an advisor if you feel that you are overcoming with emotion, um, that you really get, you know, if, if you're feeling tempted to sell in this environment or do something different, then either a single fund solution, which does this for you, or working with a professional that may be able to help you um, certainly are good things. So a lot of great points today, some invaluable advice. Uh, thank you, Fran, for being here today. Thank you, Emily.